it was sort of a tradition of ours to go and, and watch The Nutcracker. And it's sort of a cliche story, but as a child watching The Nutcracker, seeing, you know, the kids on stage and uh, the magic that was happening, it made me want to dance too. Uh, I did gymnastics before, so I was always quite athletic and physical, and I had a lot of energy as a kid. And so my mom already knew a little bit about the theater and how you would get in as a kid, because she had actually tried herself. Um, and then she was like, it's really hard to get in. And I started ballet at a, at a local ballet school where we, stayed, where we were living at the, po at the time. And after only a few sessions, she was like, you should go and audition for the Royal Theater, the ballet school there. And I did, and I got in, and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. I was raised by a single mom, and uh, there was a lot of time where I needed activities to keep me busy. And uh, my grandmother, who was a ballerina, happened to teach at a conservatoire uh, in Paris. And I would sit for some time because she was babysitting me uh, in her classes. And I was way too hyperactive to stay sitting down the whole time. So eventually it was quite clear that I had to join the class. And uh, that were, those were my first ballet classes. I had, I've been very fortunate. I've had a lot of great teachers through my, my years at the school, which was basically just good timing. Um, I had one teacher, uh, her name was Eva Draw. Uh, she was just incredible and I had her for three whole years, I think. And I can't remember one specific thing that she would tell me, but it was everything, the essence of her, t of her training that really got me to, it was where it clicked for me. It really got me to a point that was, you know, just, it became more filled with more artistry, I would say, than just the steps. And so I'm forever grateful for her. I was in a, I was first in a small conservatoire in Paris, and then eventually I got to an age where, okay, if I wanted to do this a little bit more professionally, I had to move to a better school, um, which was first a uh, dance school that was called Stenlova in Paris. Uh, from there, afterwards, I went to the National Ballet School Conservat National Superior Conservatoire in Paris, where I really uh, stayed there for four years, uh, where I had teachers like Cyril Atanasov, a big French ballet star, and uh, um, you, uh, Sergei Solovyev, who was also a big influence on me. And then I felt like I came to the end of what that school could get of me, and uh, I started doing ballet competitions uh, while I was there, and that led me to join the Cuban National Ballet School, where I studied for a year and a half uh, with Ramona de Sa and uh, Marta Iris Fernandez, who are two legends of uh, the ballet, Cuban Ballet School. And uh, I stayed there for a year and a half in La Havana, uh, which was amazing years, uh, which was almost pre-professional program per se. I mean, I was a student, but it was really a perfectioning of my technique. And from there on, Frank Anderson, who was the director of the Royal Danish Ballet, saw me and uh, offered me a contract, uh, invited me to Denmark, which eventually led to me starting at the Royal Danish Ballet 16 years ago. I did audition other places. Uh, it was a quite smooth transition for me. Um, I became an apprentice with the company and the apprenticeship in Royal Danish takes about three years. Yeah, and then by the end you have to take a, a like graduation exam and you're not guaranteed at all uh, a, co a contract with the company. So they advise everybody to audition. So I went out and I auditioned in, um, I went to Berlin, Staatsballet Berlin. Uh, was actually offered a contract, but it was right under the changing of directorship, so it was a little iffy. Uh, so I, I declined the nice offer, and then I also went to Dutch National to audition, uh, and I got a spot at the junior company there. 
But after the three years of apprenticeship, it was more, I was ready for like real company life. And then I did my graduation exam in Copenhagen and was offered a contract with the company. So I took that. During my time at the Royal Danish Ballet, I really felt like an evolution of myself. Like I really, they was, there was really an investment by the administration on me as a dancer and me in my dancing. Uh, I came in as a young 19 year old, fresh out of school, and I was really taught how to become a professional at Royal Danish Ballet. Um, I've learned, I've worked with incredible choreographers and I worked uh, a lot on the Bourneville style, which is, uh, I'm happy to now a days to be considered a Bourneville dancer by the Danes, uh, which is the biggest honor because it does take a lot uh, of personal investment and, mm, and some of the parts that I'm the most proud of are from the Bourneville repertoire. Uh, I, my first full length in Bourneville was Napoli, which I performed in China, in Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, the repertoire in World Danish Ballet is very classical. It's, uh, it's filled with the big classics. We're doing Swan Lake, Don Q, Raimonda, Bayadere, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, we are also fortunate to have the beautiful history of Bournemouth, and it's the house of, of all the, the big classical Bournemouth pieces, which is so beautiful, and we still dance them to this day. Not as many of them as we may be used to, um, but I think there's something so special when you're also you're going through, you know, the school, you learn the style, or I did. Um, and there's something so beautiful about those Born and Will pieces. So yeah, performing Napoli, uh, performing the lead in Etudes, which is also from Highlander, uh, doing that Mazurka solo on stage, at, uh, on the old stage of the Royal Theatre, are two of iconic work and almost the staples of the Royal Danish Ballet that I've had the chance to perform. And last but not least, uh, there's also James uh, in La Sylphide, which is, um, I will say with Napoli, but in different ways, really the, the, um, the holy grail of the Bourneville repertoire and uh, being able to find my own personality within these characters, uh, finding my own take on James, on his own experience with Lessel Feed and uh, has been unique in working with the ballet masters of the Royal Danish Ballet. Sorella Anglou, Nicolai Huber, Anne-Marie Vessel uh, has been an incredible journey and uh, an incredible, yeah, an incredible journey simply. We also got to do a lot of John Neumeyer's ballets, which are just filled with artistry and the, his clever way of, of knowing how to tell a story is really beautiful. And then we do the big classics. Personally, I just actually this season did my debut of Dead Deal, which was really exciting, uh, stressful, <laughs> but so exciting and really inspiring. Uh, and I got to dance it with Jonathan, who's also my partner in real life, which was also a beautiful uh, moment to share together. I do think that I will stay in the Royal Danish Ballet, uh, at least for the coming years. Uh, our director, Nikolai Huber, just got renewed for three more years, and I'm extremely happy. Um, we get to perform a wide range of repertoire, which is something that I really like. We perform a lot. We have 120 shows a year. Um, and we're a company of 80 dancers, and uh, which means that we are used in every production. And I couldn't see myself going to, into a company where I don't perform all the time. And then I got to perform, which is something that's maybe unknown in the, in the ballet world, because it's a Danish little treasure, I would say. It's a very new production from our He's still a principal dancer with the company, but he's also sort of transitioning into being the house choreographer. His name is Gregory Dean, and he created a ballet that's based as a biography, which is really interesting, on Karen Blixen, which is this huge Danish author who is not alive anymore, but she had a crazy 
crazy life story. And so it's a long three egg ballet, sort of going through her life. And there was something for me that was such a special production because you get to really deal with um, these human emotions and how you, how you transmit that to the audience, how you tell a story. That's not just the stories we read in books, but it's actually a portrait of a human being. And I found that very special and just very original. And that was also very, very great. I also did Kitri and Dan Q, which was so much fun, so much energy. And yeah, so far I've had an amazing career and I'm really humbly proud of what I've done already. Um, I love performing and I, for me the challenge as well as changing the repertoire, going from a, a Wayne McGregor into a Bourneville piece going into a, a big uh, Swan Lake is something that I enjoy and, and I've always done. And uh, it's something that uh, I thrive in. Changing styles in between each of our production can be a huge challenge, but it's a challenge that I enjoy. Uh, I've, I discover my body, I rediscover it. Changing the repertoire really allows me to rediscover the pieces each time because going from a movement of, um, of Wayne McGregor, which is really the dissociation of each part of the body, makes me the next time if I follow up with something extremely classical, all of a sudden I discover new things in my body that I maybe would have never thought were so connected. And, uh, and it's a challenge. It's not easy every time. Uh, I have an example. Once I went straight from dancing Akram Khan, Vertical Road, which was its own beast, into dancing Swan Lake. And I remember, I don't know if I can do this. But it's also one of the performances of Swan Lake that I'm the most proud of because exactly I had just discovered a new way of moving and maybe unintentionally I brought some of that into my classical dancing, which uh, is so special and uh, challenging, but also so, such a rewarding process. We're here tonight in Sintra to perform Kermessen in Bruch, which is a Bornenville pas de to sort of bring some of our heritage and uh, the beautiful style, show it to the world. Uh, it's a very, I would say, cute pas de It's much harder than it looks. The epitome of Bornoville per se, because it's, um, there's no really showing off. It really is the little, the story of uh, two young persons meeting and dancing together. But it's basically based with a pas de deux, two variations each, and then a coda. So it's a, it's a long and puffy pas de deux, but it's very beautiful, I think. It's uh, a little, uh, back and forth within the boy and the girl. We both stay on stage the whole time because we're really dancing for each other. And it's not this uh, show-off uh, piece. Um, so that's the first one. And then the second one is Cinderella Pas de Deux by choreographer Gregory Dean, which is, who is a house choreographer at the Royal Danish Ballet. Um, and it's uh, the scene where right after the big ball, he, they're finally left alone and uh, meet each other in the hallway, perhaps. We're in the, one of those great uh, ball rooms in the castle, and uh, they have maybe their first moment of intimacy together. And this may be the first time that she really discovers who he is as a person, because she's intrigued, intrigued but also um, a little bit shy, probably. And he just says, but I'm just, I just, want to dance once with you and it's a very, very nice pas de deux. I really enjoy it. And the music of Prokofiev is probably one of the most beautiful music for ballet. I love Sintra. It's my first time in Portugal ever, uh, which is a mistake and I will definitely be coming back. I think it's so beautiful here. Uh, the buildings, the culture, the beautiful nature, most of all, uh, it's, yeah, it's stunning and I'm very excited to perform here tonight.